Hey guys, I'm Richard and today I'm back with another video. So I know it's been a really long time now since my last one. Um, I think my last one came out in January of 2023, so it's been over a year at this point. And I do apologize for that. I did get very busy with school. For part of the time, I was also busy with uh, recovering from my previous injury, but I'm all good now and I am done with my undergrad. I had some time, so I was like, you know, I'm gonna film this video and give you guys some content. So today, um, we're gonna be switching gears a little bit from my previous two videos, which were both about running shoes. Today, we're gonna be talking about academics um, because that's been something that's been really big to me for the past year and a little bit um, because I was trying to get into grad school. And now that I am officially a grad school admissions success story, I feel like I can give you guys a couple of tips and tricks. Um, I'm hoping that this video can help you guys, especially those of you who are, you know, kind of in the later stages of your undergrad career and considering grad school. So like you're going to third year, fourth year, um, and you think maybe grad school is the next step. So I'm going to cover four main topics in this video. Um, the first one I think is probably the biggest one, which is going to be about deciding your interest and selecting your program. Um, second is going to be about writing the GRE. Uh, third is going to be about getting letters of references, and then I'm going to keep last one as a, like, if you want to switch fields slash um, your statement of purpose, I'm going to group those two together. Um, I'm going to talk about switching fields at the end because I do know that a lot of you will not choose to switch fields. You'll choose to continue whatever your topic was in undergrad, and that's okay, but it's something that I wanted to talk about because that is something that I did. So without further ado, um, let's start talking about deciding your interest and selecting your program. It's really important to evaluate programs holistically. I would say it's important to look through everything about the program when you're deciding, and I know this can be pretty tough um, because there's a lot of programs out there and there's a lot of information about each program, hopefully. The main things for me to consider were uh, location. Uh, that was something that I kind of considered. Um, I considered the faculty that was there pretty heavily. I consider the types of courses I'd be able to take, uh, what the outlook is like after, and uh, research opportunities. That's something that I want to do. Um, so I think it's important to decide what it is that you want. Uh, so whether you want to go into the industry or whether you want to continue in academia. If you want to go into the industry, then, uh, well, this goes for both. You should care about placements after the program. I think that's something that's really important to most people. Um, you know, it's great if you're able to learn, but if it doesn't really amount to much, then it's ultimately not that helpful. In general, I've seen that American masters are frequently terminal masters and they're designed to help you get jobs. Oftentimes you see people uh, rave about prestige and I think that's something that is very important when it comes to selecting terminal masters um, because that goes very hand in hand with placements um, and if your goal is to just get into industry I'm not sure about some fields but um, for context uh, I can speak a little bit to fields in finance um, and economics and having research experience for your average role um, isn't necessarily going to be something that puts you over the top. A lot of it is about what skills you're able to develop and what you're able to put down on your resume and how you're able to prove those skills. So that's something that you should care about. Um, and that's frequently what American masters are designed to do. Other countries might have more academic masters. So for me personally, I will be heading to Europe. Um, and in Europe, almost everything has to have a thesis. So even though the program might not be necessarily academically oriented and designed to get you into a PhD, Everybody has to write a thesis, so you need to go in there with some sort of research mindset. Something I did was I filtered through the faculty and I read a lot of the course descriptions. Um, uh, I'm choosing to go into a pretty niche field. I did look at some of the rankings, but like the field doesn't have a well-established set of rankings. So I briefly, very briefly considered like a master in finance and uh, rankings in a field like finance are pretty well established, but they're not established in every field and some fields don't care about ranking as much. 
I do want to eventually head into quant finance and at the master's level, largely people care about target schools. Those often tend to be pretty pricey, especially in the States. It sucks, but it's kind of how it is. But if you don't want to go a pricey master's route, it's entirely possible to get in through another quantitative, quantitatively focused degree. Um, for example, I've seen, uh, this is mostly from me talking to people, so I'm not the expert here, but I've seen people say you can get in from a statistics degree, actuarial science, mathematics, engineering, some of economics, and so on and so forth. So next, uh, I'll be talking a bit about the GRE. So I did pretty well in the GRE, I would say. I was happy with my performance, so I got 167 in the quantitative reasoning section, which um, in 2023 was the 83rd percentile. I got 161 in the verbal section, which in 2023 was the 87th percentile, and then I got 5.0 in the analytical writing section, which was the 91st percentile. So um, I can speak to the degrees which I looked into, which were programs such as quantitative finance, economics, econometrics, statistics, finance, and um, a couple of actuarial science degrees. Um, but the quantitative GRE is the most important for these types of fields. And it's largely American masters that will require it from you. Um, a lot of European or Canadian masters won't require it from you. Some of them, you won't even have the chance to upload your scores. I think that the GRE isn't so hard to prepare for as long as you give yourself the time. So I wrote my GRE in the end of July and I started preparing at the beginning of May. And I subscribe to this platform called GregMat. Um, it's five US dollars a month, so it's not expensive. And I think it's really good because it's very well structured and there's a lot of very clear lessons that teach you how to approach the problems. Instead of like, you know, kind of memorizing frameworks to solve it, you kind of get a feel of like what kinds of problems uh, might require what kinds of approaches. I think that it was really nice. I did about two lessons a day, so I would do one quantitative lesson and then one verbal lesson. I struggled a lot more with the verbal section. Um, I scored very well on the day of, but my diagnostic tests for the verbal section weren't looking so strong. I think for the quantitative section, usually, once you get above 165 or so, uh, a perfect score is 170. Once you get above 165 or so, you usually won't be screened out. And most schools don't tend to make admissions decisions based on the GRE. It's kind of like a screening out thing. So it's like, if your GRE score is low, they might not look at you. But if your GRE score is like 169, it might not also push you above somebody who got 166. But the main thing about the GRE is you got to practice. So I would try to practice every day. Um, my roommate and I, at the time, we were preparing together and it was brutal and we'd be very sad and stressed about it, but we would grind the GRE every day. Um, the math isn't hard, but it is tricky. Um, it goes up to about, in my experience, grade 10 level math, but it's, they try and throw some little curveballs at you and the time is tight. So you have to be familiar with everything. Next, we're gonna talk about letters of recommendations. So this was the thing that stressed me out the most. I decided I wanted to do grad school very late on. I decided basically at the start of my fourth year. So I had about um, like six to eight months to get all of my uh, things together. And I didn't particularly have professors who I had really, really close relationships with. So I had to make a couple new relationships. Um, that was partially because I didn't want to go to grad school before, so I didn't really focus on building those relationships. And also I did have uh, about a year of my schooling that happened online, so it was hard to build uh, relationships with professors during that time. Um, I think it's very obvious, but in whatever your connection with this professor is, you gotta do well. So whether it's a class or research, like you gotta apply yourself, you ideally are getting good, very good results. So the one thing that I think helped me a lot was that I was, um, the new relationships I built, I was consistently there. Um, I did very well in those classes, but I also showed 
interest and it was a genuine interest I had in the topics that we were studying and it wasn't like I was just there trying to butter them up to get me a letter of recommendation. Um, but yeah, it's, I think this is the part that a lot of people kind of struggle with. Um, the other big thing is you ideally want to get letters from professors who are well known because uh, if a admissions council reads a letter from somebody that they know that goes further than from somebody that they don't know but it's better to get a personalized letter from someone who might not be as famous but they know you better um, you don't want to have a bunch of very broad letters saying like oh this person showed up did good in my class but there's not a lot about you and your quality specifically another big thing is if your field needs it, diversify. So a good example here is economics. There's often kind of like three main branches. So people talk about microeconomics, macroeconomics, and then econometrics. Ideally, you're going to be able to get a letter from each of these disciplines. So you want a micro prof, you want a macro prof, and then an econometrics prof. I didn't have that. I had three people who taught me econometrics. Um, but you know, it kind of worked out for me. And the last thing is you need to provide necessary information to them. So that includes your academic CV, what your interests are, how many programs and which programs you're going to apply to and try to deliver the request to them on a timely manner and send thank yous every single time. Um, and when I say deliver the request on a timely manner, how it usually works is you open up the application and there's a portal, you fill out your information, and then at the end, there's uh, somewhere where you fill out their contact. So try and give them at least two weeks of time um, because professors are busy people, especially if it's you know getting to like midterm or exam time, and you don't wanna give them like one day of notice and be like, hey, like I need you to upload these four letters for me. Chances are, even if they do manage to upload all of them, it might not be the best letter. So now uh, I'm going to talk about switching fields between your bachelor's and grad school, as well as the SOP and its importance. So the SOP is the statement of purpose. So a bit about my personal journey. So my bachelor is in accounting and financial management, and I have a specialization within this bachelor in business analytics. So, you know, there's a couple of like machine learning or like statistics type classes. And those classes got me really interested in data science. Um, so I initially was going to do a master's in data science, but I was warned against it by a couple of people. Um, to this day, I'm still not too sure whether moving away from that was like is the right decision, whether they place well into data science jobs or not, but I found new interests. So I had taken a basic financial econometrics course in third year, and I really enjoyed that. I did a little bit of research into it and um, I was like, you know, data science is kind of at the like intersection of computer science and statistics and econometrics is just repackaged linear statistics. Um, so I went to the econ department to take some econometrics and I ended up really liking it. Um, I wasn't able to take classes through the stats department because I didn't have the mathematical prerequisites for it and I wouldn't have the time in my fourth year alone to like get those prerequisites. So I had to go through econometrics and I think that it wasn't as rigorous as I would have expected maybe like a stats class at the same like third year level to be. But uh, when I got to the final econometrics course, I think that one was pretty rigorous. Um, you know, we were doing some pretty cool and maybe like harder stuff there. So. I think that it did give me a decent enough background um, and it's nice because econometrics has this focus on causal inference with observational data rather than experimental data and there's a lot of emphasis on time series and finance. So financial econometrics is like kind of one of the key things that exists inside the field of quantitative finance. So I thought that, you know, this would be like for what I have, it's a pretty good background and it's like what I can get, you know? Despite that, I still am somebody who comes from an accounting and finance background. So 
My SLP had to be like absolutely immaculate during this because I kind of lacked background. So in my SLP, things I discussed were my preparation outside of class. So like projects that I had done on my own, reading that I had done, um, you know, like some courses that I basically kind of self-studied, uh, my personal interests, and I would read papers from professors at each of the schools that I applied to and kind of work that into my SOP. And I'd say something like, oh, you know, like if admitted, I would really look forward to taking classes with this professor and being able to converse with them, potentially doing research with them. Um, and I would kind of highlight like what I really like about their papers. And, you know, like I think that's something that uh, I'm lucky in that I actually enjoy it. So it's not like I'm just like, you know, saying stuff just to try and get in. Um, I think that, like, in my statement of purpose, that is a big part of my purpose of wanting to be there in the grad program. And in the end, I opted to choose a master's of econometrics over a quant finance or economics master's because of the interest I developed in econometrics specifically. Um, so I took five econometrics classes in total in my undergrad. So I took two in the finance department and then three in the econ department. And I think most econ students just take two or three. So I, I took a lot of econometrics classes. Um, economics I found wasn't exactly right for me because I find microeconomics to be something that's like very esoteric. Um, the math isn't hard, but like the nature and like the theory behind microeconomics, I just wasn't really understanding. So I was like, you know, why? struggle with it if it's not something that I'm that interested in. So yeah, that's kind of like the summary of my journey. So some points I can give are if you want to switch fields between bachelor's and grad school, it's entirely possible. I did it, a ton of people do it, but the thing is you can't expect to get there without any sort of preparation. So you need to take time ideally to be able to take um, some courses to prepare yourself. Um, so I took one extra term in total to get like all the courses I needed. And my last term didn't help me in admissions, but I do expect it to help me a lot in actually surviving in the program. And you also got to realize like, you know, if you're switching uh, disciplines, chances are you're not going to get into Harvard um, because there will be people who are far more qualified and with that said, it's not a bad thing to apply to reaches, but just temper your expectations a little bit. Um, and last thing is in the fields that I know about for grad school. So like economics, econometrics, statistics, quantitative finance, actuarial science, even traditional finance. It's generally more important to take more math rather than classes from those fields exactly if you had to choose between the two. Obviously, being able to do both is best, but um, a lot of masters, even in something that you might think isn't as mathematically heavy, such as traditional finance or economics, a lot of masters will require you to have multivariable calculus at the minimum. A lot of you know more prestigious master's programs in these fields might even want you to have real analysis, um, especially for masters that tend to lean heavily on the theory side. So in those cases, um, the economics is the stuff that they might be able to teach you, you know, like the theory, but the mathematics is a little bit harder to just like kind of pick up a textbook and learn on your own in like a couple of weeks. So yeah, that concludes my video. And if you guys have any questions, um, please do comment down below and I'll do my best to answer and if I think the question is good enough, I might even make a, another video out of it. But um, if you guys are planning on applying to grad school, good luck. Good luck with your GREs if you're going to take them. And I wish you guys all the best. Thanks.